10 a.m. <laughs> energy is a lot sleepier. <laughs> But it is 10 a.m. for me. I but actually I like the I like the weird energy. So, so go go ahead. Uh oh, we're on. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> Wait, are we on? Is that yeah? It? I gave you the finger multiple times. You sure are. Oh, all right. Well, hello. <laughs> we are live with Kelly Thompson, a guest that we have been so excited to have. We are speaking with the writer of Black Cloak, The Call, Black Widow, everybody's favorite, the winner of the Comics Pals Pally Awards Series of the Year, Birds of Prey. Ooh, that's we were right. speaking with Kelly Thompson. Thank you so much for joining us, Kelly. That's so awesome. I didn't realize that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. You haven't gotten your trophy yet? <laughs> yeah, Ooh, where is that? Oh, no. It's in Come the on. mail. Come on, guys. Get it together. <laughs> I'm still smelting it. I'm, it's my first one. <laughs> Our operation is a bit fledgling, but we try. We try. <laughs> Uh, so we we are we are happy to be here with Kelly right now. Thank you to everybody who is tuning in with us live or in the future. We are going to talk about all of Kelly's tremendous work uh, because it has been it's been about a year since we last spoke and uh, things have changed. Things have changed. So we're going to get into <laughs> all of that um, before we do. Before we do, I just want to say, first of all, if you are listening to this, make sure that you stay to the end. Because we will be giving away a volume one of one of Kelly's awesome books, whichever you want, whether that's Black Cloak, whether that's The Call, whether that's Birds of Prey, whether it's Black Widow, whether it's Captain Marvel, whatever it is that you want, we're going to give one of those away to a lucky winner. All you have to do is leave a question or comment for Kelly, and we will uh, we will get that uh, sorted at the end of the show. Also, I want to say thank you to our patrons. This podcast is supported by our patrons and our YouTube channel members. So, really quick, special shout out to the best pals in the universe, Thunderstruck, Rebecca Alejandro, the Hound of Justice, Atomic Hound, Starcross, Starcross, Catherine Stars, and the Red Spiral. And I also want to shout out the Night Stalker, Harris Dijinsky, Brian Demolish, Del Pozo, Kefis the Incorruptible, Momentum Mike Elliott, Dan the Truth Trudeau, Joel Justice, Jalen the Sanguine Sorcerer, Marley Manistorm, Slow Flow Dameron, Amin Almighty Perez, Pete the Dreamweaver Collins, Christian Uncaged Harriet, and Always Laughing. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate you. Super Chats are open if you guys want to do that. Join the channel if you want. Subscribe. Okay. Thank you. Now that all of that <laughs> feeling is out of the way, right. <laughs> we can put the focus on the guest of the hour kelly birds of prey first of all how dare you oh <laughs> <laughs> no the, the how dare you the how dare you was how fans were initially reacting to the announcement of the book mm. which was absolutely ridiculous and i want to say off off rip you <laughs> shut the haters down with an incredible series it has to feel so good yeah to see the reaction that you're getting <laughs> yeah. now compared to what it was like before people even saw one page of this of this book it does feel pretty good but <laughs> i gotta be honest i'm a little um i don't i don't know if what this is going to do to my reputation but i'm not i know there are a lot of people that like really would love me to be a villain i'm i'm very innocent and good <laughs> I'm telling you, it's very pure. I just want to make good comics and people to have fun. Like I, I don't, um, I don't have. I'm not trying to fuck anyone up out here. I'm not trying to. I'm only trying to write some good stories and make people feel some things. And you know, I when when people were so mad about the book when we were first launching, like the very first launches when they didn't see Barbara by the end of the week and people were getting so mad about it. Yeah, I like. I understood it. I'm a fan too. I get it. It's hard. You get you, you you get your hopes up a lot of times and things aren't good. I I understand where it comes from, but you know, I'm I'm on the other side and I'm looking at the book and I'm looking at Leo's the pure joy of these spreads and these characters and these interactions and everything and I just I don't know. I had a I had a bit of a breakthrough on Birds of Prey with social media the way I haven't ever had before, which is a letting go of it a little bit. Like I just, sure. you know, t I, I heard Tom King said a long time ago that like, you really just have to let the work speak for itself. And I have trouble with that. 
because I like to talk to people about it and I, I want to help them understand if it's not there or whatever, but there is a lot of truth. A lot of writers talk about like, once it's out there, it's not yours anymore. And it's how readers interpret it. Like it becomes theirs and it's very true, but there's a, just this weird thing in comics where there's all this judgment before it comes out. And it's a really hard system for anyone, whether the book ends up being good or bad, or you get what you want, or you don't get what you want. And it's like not something we can really change because comics are always really hard already to promote and get out there and like let people know about. So you can't really stop doing solicits and preview pages and all these things but it really is for the creators i just think it's incredibly difficult because people are just judging everything about you know part one of a six-part story like before you know a year before it's coming out you're already getting people who are angry or mad or excited or whatever and it's like it feels very frustrating because you're just trying to make good stuff and get it out there and hopeful people hopefully people can find it and I understand why they get upset, but I don't know how we get out of this spin we're in. And it's very sad. I think for everyone, I think nobody's happy. I think the creators aren't happy. I think fans aren't happy because they're either mad about some shit or they're frustrated with other fans. Like, why can't we celebrate this stuff? It's it's a very weird spin we're in. And it's it's a little sad. But I think when the when the cover for uh, seven got released that had um, Barbara on the cover in in the in the Batgirl outfit, which man, that was my call, and boy, do I regret that because woo. Um, I just I just had to. I knew inside the book she was basically Oracle, and everyone was yelling at me for her not being Oracle, and I was like, I just got to disengage, and they can read yeah. it, and they can like it or not, and that's all I can do, and so I just sort of took a step back and. I think it was the right thing to do, but I'm sorry that it has to be that way because when social media started out with creators and fans of which I was a fan, not a creator, it was this great way to have access to them. But it's it's sort of the snake that eats, it's eaten itself a little bit, I think. And so now we're in a weird spin, but it feels really good that the book is speaking for itself and that people are either were won over instantly or have slowly been won over or it's been really wonderful to see that. I mean, yeah, the, the, my my philosophy when it comes to comic book releases at this point is, you know, try to withhold judgment until, you know, you actually see the stuff. Um, and it's unfortunate that others can't do that. I like I get that there's an attachment that you have to characters that you love. But uh, I mean, geez, these characters are going to outlive all of us. Um, and a majority of them have been around since before many of us were even here. So it's kind of just one of those things where your relationship to it is personal. You have to let you have to let the creators cook. Um, we yeah. want the stories, right? Like we're like we want the stories. You're not not every one of them is going to be for you. But luckily, the Batgirl story you really love still exists. Yeah, you know, my part said the other day, and this wasn't really what we were talking about. It was sort of in relation to something related but different. And he was like, you know, for me, in the end, art always wins. And he sort of meant like. Mm -hmm. It ends up being how I took it and how I apply it here is that art is transformative and it's not everything is going to speak to everyone. But when you have the experience of having some piece of art, whatever it is, music, movies, comics, whatever, and it moves you, it's an experience you never really forget. And I think you continue to chase it in what you look for. And I don't know if... I don't know if people just can't keep that self-awareness in their head that like everyone needs those kind of things and everyone's different. So <laughs> every, <laughs> all those kind of stories need to be out there. And like, once you can connect to them, I don't know, the art, the art wins, the art will always win. Like all the things we want to put on it or make it about, or the controversies or all this stuff in the end, was there an amazing thing that was created? Was it powerful for people? Did it do something or say something like to me, that's what I got to focus on and hope that I can gather up the people that it works for along the way. But it's a really, it's been a very tricky journey with this, like to, to sort of become niche famous very niche famous it during a social media time when we're all sort of learning and figuring it out it's been very strange i'm 
I'm super grateful for it because it certainly helped me um, launch my career in many ways, but it's, it's very painful. I mean, I see creators taking a knee all the time where they're like, yeah, I can't, I can't do it anymore. And I don't think it's good for any of us that they have to do that. You know, it's certainly not, it's certainly going to make social media less fun if none of those people want to give anyone access, but maybe this is just the trajectory you have to go through growing pains. Right. And it's so weird because we used to have, I feel like we used to have these forums, right? Like Warren Ellis, yeah. I remember had a really yeah. cool forum and you know, yeah. all these like creators were so accessible in the, in the early days of the internet. And I feel like it wasn't like this and maybe that's my rose colored glasses, but nowadays people are just so comfortable being really nasty. Um, yeah. And you know, that makes me thankful in a lot of ways for the community that we have here. Um, yeah because everybody is so supportive. I mean, my God, the, the excitement level about you coming on the show, <laughs> um, you know, it's so, it's so heartening to see that because it's like, yes, this is what comics is about. Like, let's get great books that we like and let's have creators on here so that we can celebrate the work that they're doing that we're loving. Yeah, that's great. That's, I felt that way about Substack too. You know, before I got the pro account, I had already gone over there. A few of us had, and it was because social media was getting so rough. We were like, maybe we got to build lifeboats here. We don't know what's going to happen. And so I was really glad that I had already started doing that before I got the Substack Pro and then getting the Substack Pro, you know, allowed me to make some more comics and devote some more time to it and really grow that. And as Twitter has, you know, gone down in flames, um, I just have been so grateful for that community. Like you said, it's to build your own space where people can connect over this stuff and where it's very civil. I, I don't think it's dishonest. It's just... You know, I it, I don't know. When you build a smaller community like that, I feel like you end up with people not being anonymous and talking more how they would to your face than, you know, behind a shield. So I don't know. Exactly. And we've we found that with our own community in, in Discord and yeah, you know, the people that exactly. watch our show and, you know, even the people that don't regularly interact with us, like, it, it, you know, it's it's weird to say, but you can feel the vibes, you know, yeah, like, yes, totally. That same as the sub stack. It's like I go into the comments and, you know, part of being in my sub stack is you get to talk to me. That's fun. But it's also about getting to talk to each other. Like people are like recommending books to each other and stuff. It's great. I love it. And like the more of that kind of stuff we can build, you know, I think we all like it's not none of us feel ideal about it the same way we all feel a little frustrated that there was nowhere to go after twitter because we all want to be centralized together sure but that's not really working what we're having to do is split off into these smaller smaller more reasonable groups i don't know i don't yeah. know about history is this how it always happens i don't know i don't know <laughs> see you know what it is it's the tower of babylon it's <laughs> biblical you there know? you go. There you, you go. try to you try to speak a common <laughs> language to talk to God, and He yeah. breaks you apart. Yeah, there you go. I don't want to know where uh, Elon Musk uh, lies in that analogy, but <laughs> oh God, <laughs> not not at the top. No, okay. no. <laughs> he's the tower. He's gonna crumble. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about the book a little bit. Let's talk about yeah. Birds of Prey. So, Birds of Prey. You know, it's Kelly Thompson. It's it's Leonardo Romero. Just just putting his whole ass into this. Just really like. <laughs> Just really showing why he's one of the best in the industry. Um, it's it's been incredible. And then you were also joined by RS Dane on issue five. Uh I, sorry, go ahead. I, I, I don't know if that's the correct that's how I say it to RS Dane, but I don't know if that's correct. Sorry. My apologies if it's not. Um and then <laughs> in issue seven by Javier Pina, Toddlers by Jordi Belair, and Letters by Clayton Cowell. So already, right? I say those names, incredible creative team. But then you get into the book and you get into these characters and I just found myself enraptured. Um, this was a phenomenal, just like even if we're evaluating the first arc, um, my first time reading Birds of Prey, I have no exposure at all. Individually, yeah. you know, certainly bits mm -hmm. and pieces. I love Batgirl, um, Bar Big Bar oh my God, I love Big Barda. <laughs> but, um, you know, not as a team ever. And so I found myself blown away by the team dynamics. I really appreciated the character interactions and getting to know them better through their interpersonal relationships. I never had an affinity for Black Canary before, but her as a leader has been fun to read. Her as a sister, we're getting to see like 
all these different aspects of who she is evaluating her relationships with others, including Green Arrow. So that was a lot of fun. And it's just so it's just so kick ass. The action's incredible. You know, there's heart and soul in this book. I mean, it's it's really a phenomenal series so far. And one of the things that I, I appreciate, Kelly, and, and this is, you know, going back to your West Coast Avengers stuff, is that you're really good at giving everyone their moment on a team book. Um, and a lot of comics, I feel like with, with team dynamics, the uh, screen time gets lost for certain characters. Yeah. But with an ensemble cast, there's something you do something where it's like, all right, everyone kind of gets their moment here. Uh, which I really appreciate. It's funny, you know, one of the big complaints about Birds of Prey was a lot of people felt a certain way about Harley being on the team. Like 50% of the people hated it and 50% mm. thought it was the greatest thing ever. And <clears throat> a lot of the people who were upset about it, their big concern was she was going to take over. Mm-hmm. And I was like, listen, she's always going to be the jokey character among these more serious characters. It's literally help helps that she's there for that reason to like cut the tension and cut the seriousness of it. It works really well, but I didn't want to spoil anything, but like her big contribution, her big getting a team moment was the thing she did with, with King shark in the beginning, getting them on the Island. And so people were like, Oh, I'm sure she's going to save the day at the end. And it'll be a big, and I'm like, you know, again, this comes back to that thing where just, I can't just talk about it. What do I'm going to do? Spoil yeah. the whole arc to satisfy your concerns that she's going to take over. And she really doesn't. She takes a back seat after that stuff with King shark and she's supportive and she's there and she's fighting and she's helping but that was her moment and zealots comes in six and you know sins and magara's comes in five and six i guess and you know cassandra's comes early too you know it's uh cassandra sort of comes in one and so i do think that that's that goes right back to this social media thing and like talk trying to talk about the project can be really difficult but i think you're completely right and i don't think i'm glad it was nice of you to say that about west coast avengers i hope i did it well there as well but i did have to learn a couple hard lessons where i'm like shit i didn't plan this enough and now Mm -hmm. I don't have enough room for if I want this big, cool fight that we've been planning, I don't also have enough room for this other little thing to give so-and-so their shine. And so I do, when I go into an arc now, I really look for, you know, okay, here's the sort of very B level story that's maybe going on with this character. And like, here's where that beat is going to be their big moment, but you know, it's hard in an ensemble like that with, with limited pages, um, especially with when you're dealing with big action scenes, you know, that eats page time so much. So it's a tricky balance and you don't always get it exactly right. But I think I'm very happy with these first six issues together. I think they're going to read beautifully in trade too. I hope the, I hope the chapter that's set like inside Megara with the different art will like read a little better for people who struggled with that in trade. Cause I think it'll be more seamless. Mm. Um, but uh, I'm pretty excited about it. And then you guys haven't seen eight yet, but <laughs> it's um so it's Javier Pina and um, David Lopez uh, helped him out. And so all the action spreads are these giant double page spreads mm. set in the same location of them just tearing stuff up. And it's, it's so beautiful. It's so fun. It's um yeah, it's really good. I, I really love it. It was, um, you know, Leo had to leave, which is sort of an announcement, but sort of not. I mean, um, I he hasn't been in any of the solicits for a while, but there hasn't been some big announcement. But he is not on the next arc, and that's because he had to go back to animation for some stuff. So we didn't lose him to another book. We lost him to animation, which has happened to me before. It continues to be my great heartbreak <laughs> that I can't keep Leo forever. Um, I'm hopeful he'll come back to us. I know he loves doing the book, so I'm hopeful we'll get him for a future arc again if he comes back to comics for a bit. Um, I know he likes to sort of split his time between them. Um, But so our next arc coming up has a weird, there's basically a portal element 
and the characters keep going through it and like the world gets reskinned when they do that so it gets reskinned to look like something else and so we'll have five different artists doing but they're all really interesting they're all really cool i don't know if i can say who they all are but it's going to be very fun i'm huh. pretty nervous about it because it's a very high difficulty t level to do this kind of thing and it's also um because people had such an averse reaction to the non-Leo art, it becomes scary. But mm. I hope people can get into the idea because it's a really fun way to play with the characters, to play with the worlds, and to have some fun. But we'll see. I don't know how many of the names. All of it has been cast now, but I don't know how many of the names I'm able to say. So I got to I gotta probably... I can, uh, I can probably tell you who's on because we missed the solicits because it wasn't locked down by them, but um, on what issue is it? 10, no, nine. Nine is the first issue of the, where the portal is involved. And so that's Jonathan case. And then Gavin Gudry is drawing like um, there will be sections. Basically Meridian isn't able to go through the portal. So it'll be a dual story, mostly taking place inside whatever's beyond the portal and then cutting back to like small sections with Meridian trying to get them out from her side. And so Gavin's doing those sections through all the issues. And then uh, Jonathan's got this first chapter, which is sort of like nightmare Gotham vibes. It's very fun. So that, that all sounds huh. amazing. And um, it's funny because, you know, Gavin Gidry is actually in the chat right now. And Gavin ah! is a, is a friend of ours. <laughs> Gavin's a member yeah. of our community. We've He's known awesome. Gavin. Yeah. Gavin's great. Um, Gavin's really great. I mean, I I loved Leo on the book. Leo's work was phenomenal, but I think, you know, it, as is the nature of comics, unfortunately, a lot of times creative teams don't actually stick together for, you know, dozens of issues, you know, like it used to be. And uh, I think Javier's doing great work, and I know He's, Gavin yeah. does great work. I'm not familiar with Jonathan Case yet, but I will be. Um, So I think we just have to accept it. And, and, uh, and you know... You know you know what, John Jonathan's done a ton of great stuff, but one thing that pertains specifically to us who like Birds of Prey is he did that incredible issue of Batgirls that was almost all silent with Cassandra Kane, where Cassandra Kane is investigating. Really beautiful issue. And yeah. also, I should say Jordy is going to keep coloring all of it. And so that's going to really help to you know not only does she really get what we're doing and you don't have to micromanage her and also she's a genius but it'll also help keep us really cohesive even while these worlds and styles change a lot it'll um it'll it'll be uh it'll it'll be a sort of anchoring effect i think uh with her colors so it's it's pretty fun i'm very excited we're introducing some new characters we're gonna get this big time traveling villain out there um, Barbara has a very juicy, weird arc, a small, but good, I think. So, um, I'm excited. I'm excited to see where we can take these ladies. One of the artists is someone I'm getting to reteam with after a long time. Very excited about. So mm -hmm. it's a lot of, lot of exciting stuff happening. On that note, um, can I ask a bit of a process question? Yeah, of course. You know, with, you're saying with this arc, you're going to have so many different artists. Are they artists that you have a relationship with and if so or if not how do you feel like you tailor to those uh artists it's a good question in fact i'm behind on a script right now and it was because part of it not all of it some of it's just because i'm a nightmare but um we part of it is we hadn't locked down the artist and mm. i was really struggling to get it right not knowing what it needed to look like you know what i mean like yeah. like i did what we were behind i had already turned in the script but we were having trouble casting we were looking for a very specific person when we were looking for jonathan for this first gotham nightmare and we just kept striking out our deadline was too tight and so that was limiting our options as well so we were having some trouble and um I had, when we assigned him, I went in and made a few changes. Cause I was like, you know what, he's going to really do great with this thing. So I'm going to put that in and, you know, like, so yeah, you definitely tweak it a little bit to fit. I mean, I think that's ideal comics making is that, you know, your artist and you're writing to your specific artist. I write different for Leo 
than I write for other people. I mean, part of the reason we're having a five people tackle this art arc is that I designed it specifically for Leo knowing he could do it because of our previous history. I know what he's capable of. I know what he can put in. I know somewhat how he thinks, at least, I think. Uh, we're in really good creative sync. It's very natural. Um, I do think now when I look back, I was like, perhaps you were asking too much of him, Kelly. Um, but before I got a chance to pitch it to him, we found out he had to go back and do some animation stuff, or got to, I should say. Um, and uh, so I was like, I looked at it and I was like, oh, I, I don't I don't know anyone who can just do this and i'm sure there are artists that can do it but i don't have a relationship with someone who can do what i laid out for leo on that time to i didn't know anyone else and so that was part of why i was like i think if we want to do this arc the only way to do it is to break it up and give it to a bunch of different cool artists who can jam out together mm -hmm. you know making it as opposed to one guy building it um but yeah it's uh it's been really fun. It's been really fun. I'm very nervous about it because it's a lot of stuff to juggle and it's a lot of, it's, I feel like it's very high level comics. Like you're, you're asking a lot of your artists, you're asking a lot of scheduling, you're asking a lot of everybody to like sort of come together and make it work. But I do think if we can do it, it's going to be really, it's a high risk, high reward, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's, every, I have every bit of confidence because Birds of Prey so far hasn't let me down. So Thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to what comes next. Uh, Thank you. Kelly, you mentioned that Jordy is going to be coloring all those artists, right? Mm -hmm. what, the the color choices Jordy has made, was there any kind of collaboration <laughs> on, on that decision? Because they're not traditional. No, uh, they're way at all. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> they're way not traditional. They're, we wanted to do a really weird, like, pulpy thing. Um. And she and I had played with this on Black Widow um, because, you know, Black Widow is a very specific palette. And for all of the issues, it's basically the same. There's one flashback that uses a different approach, but everything else is um, this very specific palette for Black Widow. And then one issue is a flashback. The entire issue is a flashback fight scene to establish a villain from her past that's re-entered the scene. And so we were like, let's do it in a cool, pulpy, retro, almost like a dot matrixy, where it seems like misaligned, a little bit like what we do on Birds of Prey. And we had so much fun with it. It was cool. The textures, everything about it. And when we were first trying Birds of Prey, I got to be honest, we didn't even really talk about it. She sent in a few you know she and leo and i have worked together a lot before and so there's a lot of trust and understanding in that relationship already and she sent in a couple ideas and honestly i thought leo and i were going to love it and ben was going to be like our editor ben abernathy was going to be like too far guys no i gotta i gotta pull you back and he was like it's awesome and i was like i mean it looks like nothing else on stands today like i'm excited about it aren't you and he was like yeah it's really good and then he never made us pull back on it and i was so proud of him and so proud of dc and so excited that they would let us try this and i do think it's spectacular and i was really excited to see how she brought it you know um aris the only chapter that doesn't really look like that is aris he colored that himself and that was deliberate choice we made but i was interested to see um i believe she's colored peanut before i can't remember um javi but I was interested to see how she was going to take that same approach and apply it to very different art. And I thought it really worked. I thought I, because I thought maybe we're going to try to change tracks because it wouldn't play on, on Javi's stuff the way it did on Leo's, but it was beautiful. It was awesome. I mean, I think that flashback scene with Vixen is like one of the coolest Vixen scenes I've ever seen. And there it is. We did it. It's awesome. I mean, it's just a simple fight scene, but the the way Javi did the art and the way she applied it in the colors, like especially with the red and her connection to the red, I thought it was genius. Really good. Yeah. She deserves all the Eisners, man. It's crazy. <laughs> Jordi is a legit superstar. Absolutely. She really is. Now, is it is it fair to say you're a fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, right? I am. Okay, so so am I. That's <laughs> why when 
when I I was I was rereading it today, and there's the moment where um you know Dinah um she kind of like goes nonverbal after after Sin gets kidnapped mm-hmm. by Megara, mm-hmm. and it reminded me immediately. I've been on a Buffy kick lately of <laughs> when Dawn gets kidnapped by Glory and oh, Buffy yeah. goes catatonic. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they have like a whole episode, don't they? Where yeah. she's like, like in Willow's in her mind to try yep. to like get her to snap out of it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, we didn't have time for that, but. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just love that moment. It, it just made me think about Buffy and it it allowed me to root myself in who Dinah is. She cares yeah. so much about her sister that this is the reaction she has the same way that Buffy does. It's almost like her yeah. sister is an extension of herself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I just really appreciate that. It helped me understand who she is. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, you know, when you say that it's, it's funny because it seems like everybody's, I mean, I hear a lot about Cass and Barta, but Dinah, people just love her. And it's so funny writing Dinah. Uh, you're one of the only people I've ever heard be like, oh, I don't really know Black Canary that well. I've never been that attuned to her because people just love her. And it's like the opposite of writing Carol Danvers. Mm. Even though they're powerful, blonde, hot, badasses, uh, everyone fucking hates Carol Danvers. And you have to work so hard all the time to make them understand that she's great. And Dinah, everyone's like, nah, she's cool. I don't know. It's the fishnets, maybe. I don't know. That's, ex- that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. You know what the missing component on Carol is? <laughs> It's, I'm a fool. I should have put her back in the fishnets or, or in fishnets rather. Yeah, I'm sure Twitter would love that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> then, then the other people are mad at you. The other side. Uh, it's no win. No win. Uh, you, you've really established yourself as someone who can handle an ensemble cast. Like, I mean, you've done it almost everywhere, but with Birds of Prey and then the call, we'll talk about the call later. Like, these are two books that really, really understand who the characters are, how their interplay should be, and how to bring drama and also a lot of fun just from the characters talking. Like, it's just so fun to read. I, I feel like some comics are a little bit um, cumbersome to read at times. Birds of Prey just feels so breezy because it's fun and it's engaging the dialogue. Thank you. I work very hard on my dialogue. It's very important to me. This stuff doesn't feel awkward. Um, some of the biggest fights um, editors and I get into, and they're not really fights. They're just disagreements. But if we're not, dis- as long as I've got the right art team on my book, I'm very easy to work with, I think. Other than lateness is always a problem for writers. We're we're a cursed lot. We're a cursed and miserable lot, and all our things are late all the time. It's frustrating. Um But other than that, I think I'm pretty easy to work with if we have the right art team. But I do get very annoyed when they want to massage the text in ways, hey, here's this information we have to get in here. And they're not wrong. We need clarity. We need understanding. We have to do all these things. But like sometimes they'll be like, she should really call her spider woman here. And you're like, She's her best friend. She's not going to call her Spider Woman in this moment. It's her name's Jess. Like, I just, you know, and I understand where that note comes from. It's like a corporate note. They're like, people need to know that's Spider Woman. And you're like, no, people need to know it's her best friend. And you don't fucking call your best friend Spider Woman when you're having a conversation with her. Like, it's weird. And it happens all the time. And I really bristle about it. I don't know how other writers are. Maybe they just do it. And maybe that's why editors keep asking them to do it. I will go back in and rewrite the whole page to find a way to not say that if I have to. Like, I mean, it doesn't always work, but most of the time it does. And I do think it helps the comics read a little, like you say, breezier. I don't I don't think it's some amazing, brilliant trick I'm doing. I think it's just I like it to sound like real people and real people don't all of a sudden go hello spider woman like i mean they just it's not how they talk it's not how people are it's and i need them to be people like i know you need them to be recognizable superheroes but i need them to be people that we care about and that make sense so um i do spend probably too much time like finessing that kind of stuff but honestly i'm glad like if it makes it feel breezy and not like a chore to read it then like mission accomplished right um 
but uh yeah i can't remember what i was talking about well one, <laughs> one of the bits that jumps out to me it was uh the most recent issue of birds of prey that was released uh where where dinah and, and, and barbara are talking and they just say like i missed you you know like yeah. just little things like that i was like man i just don't feel like i'm getting this in big two comics as often as i want just like people genuinely just liking each other and being honest with each other as humans rather than superheroes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. that's, that's like this thing I said before where I was like, I don't know what this is going to be due to my reputation, but I'm just like naive and good. I do sometimes have a little bit of trouble with this because there is a, I'm a weird combination of untrusting and naive at the same time. Whereas I've been, I've been conditioned to just, I don't know. Like I'm prey, not predator. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense to any of you? I don't know if dudes oh, yeah. understand this, but you, I guess you probably do because some dudes are very big predators. Anyway, um, so you know, prey is untrusting. It doesn't. It, it doesn't relax. So I'm prey like that, but I'm also just naive. I don't understand why people don't want to just get along and have a nice time like i i don't know why we're making it hard you know it's like it's like when people are complaining about their jobs and they're like why, why does it have to be like this it's not brain surgery and i'm like exactly like it's why is it like this like <laughs> we all want our lives to be better and especially when you're working in something like comics it's like it's like uh it just should be fun like it's a dream scenario and when i'm looking at the characters sometimes I don't know. I just want them to be like that. I just want them to be likable. I want them to be someone that you really wish you knew in your real life. And so when they're like really sharp and angry all the time at each other, or they don't seem like they could be real people you could have a conversation with, that just doesn't really make sense to me. But, but I think there's also a flattening out of things with that approach, right? There's there's a lot of variety to people, and I can't flatten everyone out to be like likable people I'd like to know. So there's a danger there. Like I think it, it it starts in a good place where it makes people really relatable, and hopefully it makes like things like dialogue and scenarios really believable. But there is also a flattening out where you're making it too easy and and not enough controversy and not enough of reality because reality is harsh and horrible and you know not everybody's life is hey it's nice out here have a good time like my where i get to come from with that is loaded with so much privilege of like having a nice safe comfortable american existence you know that's how I get to be able to come to that. And that's not the scenario everyone has. And so you really have to think outside yourself. Like I can't just make everything like, oh, a nice little thing that I'd like it to be. And I feel like I see that a lot in, gosh, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things happening in fiction now where it's like, I don't want characters to be unlikable. I don't want characters to have opinions I disagree with or I, but you have to put these things in there because that's where we figure shit out. That's how we figure out, Oh, that's the bad guy. Yeah. Cause he's saying that stuff. That's why he's bad. Like they, we have <laughs> to do all this. You can't just flatten it all out to make everyone nice. It's helpful to make everyone nice because then you're like, Oh, these characters are interesting and cool. And I want to know them. And it's all really cool but but if you make it just that there there's nothing else there there's you know i i run into people all the time who are like well i just want i just want black widow to be happy and i'm like well that's not really a story like wouldn't you rather see her go through things and overcome things and become yeah. more and experience more like that's what it has to be yeah i mean stories are not just vessels for you to feel good yeah. um you know, I feel like some of my favorite stories of all time have a lot of dark stuff in them. Like, you know, yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's funny. It's funny you said all that because just the other day I was seeing people talk about how they how much they hate season six because of how sad Buffy is. And it's the like, well, yeah, she just died. The yeah. best, the <laughs> best season. I love. Yes. Season <laughs> six. is. I think season five is the best. But season six is phenomenal because of all of that inner conflict and turmoil. Yeah. These people are growing up and, you know, yes, of course, we all want Buffy to be happy. And I wanted her with Angel and everything else. We don't always get what we want. You know, that's just yeah. not life. Life is the big bad. Yeah. It's, life. That's... 
it's also when you're asking, you know, for these characters to be happy, like at some point that boils down to what you're asking for is an ending. Yeah. Well, I think that's, that's the real crux of it is that people want endings. They crave endings. We all do, but Mm. we also have been conditioned now to crave this unending stream of entertainment and I hate the word, but content. Right. Mm. And so, you know, here here we are like uh, yeah stories need to have endings i mean it's really people people talk all the time about the or they do it less now than they did before i feel like more in claremont or post claremont directly post post claremont era you hear people talking about how comics are like soap operas Mm. and they are but the real reason they are is not because they're about interpersonal drama like Chris Claremont made them it's because of the incredible churn of the endlessness of them they never end you can never grow up you can never have children and pass that on to those children you're stuck in time now comics do does suck in time better than soap operas do quite frankly because soap operas have real actors who age um but you know it's the same it's all the same problems and it's not I don't know. I don't know what it is in us. And I have it too. You know, I guess we just fall in love with something and we don't want to let it go because that's painful, but things have to end, man. They need endings. It's, I don't, I don't know what it, it's almost sort of not having an ending is almost sort of like hellish. You know what I mean? Like Mm. this idea of an infinite is, I don't know, maybe it's just the prey in me, but that's not a calming thought, you know? So Mm. And and as a writer, as anyone who creates, like, yeah, it's it, narratively there. There's no future in it. There, it. Like, I mean, that's how we ended up with sort of these arcs. And so you try to create these narrative <sighs> closures within those arcs so that you can keep building. But it's really hard. It's really hard to do. Because and and have it still be satisfying for everyone and like not feel like you're spinning your wheels and. You know, I mean, the reason it's hard to find something new to do with Superman is or Spider-Man or Batman or Wolverine or whoever is because there have been hundreds and hundreds of stories of them, some of them truly brilliant and some of them really fucking awful, you know, but like there's hundreds of them. It's like it's hard to find new ways to do that. I think the, the task is even harder when, to your point, you're ending an arc you have to set up the conflict again, right? Yeah. In closing, you have to set yeah. up the opening once more. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, and yeah, go ahead. it's got to be different, but also it can't be too different because you're picking up, right? You're literally starting it before, or you're picking up something that was already established before you're even ending. So it can't be that dissimilar because it has to organically flow from one to the other. It's very tricky. And, and, and to that, to that, point you know you think about the uh the the historic uh daredevil challenge you know uh, uh, a creator will leave daredevil in a mess and the next creator has to pick it up (laughs) yeah you know yeah recently zdarsky just sent matt murdoch to hell and then brought him back and he doesn't remember who he is and he's a priest well you know the the first issue of salad at a men's run is like now he's fighting demons and it's like whoa that's not anything daredevil has ever done before and it's just <laughs> you know it's 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 gotta be hard to continue to set that up in a yeah. new and surprising way yeah i'm doing um i'm gonna this is gonna be maddeningly vague um <laughs> although when it gets announced some people who are listening to this will be very excited because they'll be like that's what she was talking about I'm I'm pitching the biggest thing of my life right now, probably, and the hardest for just this very reason. How do you how do you approach this character in a new way that you know people have already done all these great things with and told all these amazing stories with? And honestly, I almost turned the job down because I just didn't I didn't see it. I didn't see how I could do it. And then as it goes, I had an idea. And it broke it all open for me and I'm truly excited about it. I'm really, really excited about it. And the idea that I almost didn't do it 
because I was like, Eesh, I can't see it. I can't see how you do this. So let someone else fall on this sword. <laughs> and uh, yeah, now, I mean, I'm still terrified because you never know how it's all going to come together, but I'm very excited about it. And I feel very confident. I came out of the it was already sort of greenlit. I mean, like I, we'd already talked about it when I had the like zoom call where we were like going over some of the finer details. And so I realized when I got off the call, I didn't even act like I was waiting for an official green light. Like I was just talking about it. Like we all know this is good, right? Like it was very, <laughs> it was like the most accidental confidence I've ever gone into anything with. I was not even nervous. Cause I was like, I just know it's good. <laughs> so it was funny. Is that funny. is that the the black label pitch that you've kind of teased in the past? Actually, no, no, that Ooh. I'm still working on that. I'm still working on that. Although working on this thing did unlock some um, not ideas, but like some of the stumbling blocks I was having with that, like something about it's amazing how that works. I, I suspect a lot of creators will tell you that, like when working mm -hmm. on something else, it really yeah. unlocks other things that you've pushed to the back of your mind, like that you cannot figure out. But I will say that for me, you know, I get into a mode where I'm like, oh, well, I can't write that yet because my brain is still working on that in the background. Mm -hmm. But my brain doesn't work very hard if I'm not working. So <laughs> if I if I push that to the background and I'm writing something else, it might be working on that. If I just start playing Marvel Snap, I find it does not seem to work on the problem. Yep. <laughs> which is a painful a painful realization but it's annoying <laughs> glad to hear you're still playing marvel snap by the way i am i was having fun with my x-men deck when they were doing that x-men versus avx and then they turned it off and that deck is shit without that little bonus yep. i was like stop playing it immediately <laughs> i put that deck right down <laughs> I, I couldn't make the avengers version of it work very well for me the flex right it was much harder to do than the x-men one yeah, because you had to put them all in the same all location. in one spot, and yeah. it's like if you have to do that, I felt like the deck had to be pure Avengers to make it work. And whereas my X Men deck could be like mostly, I think I had like nine X Men on there and like a couple, a couple ringers from somewhere else, and uh, that worked much better than the Avengers deck, which I played like three times, and I was like, nope, I can't make that work. We'll go <laughs> on to this. <laughs> Don't don't convince me to start playing that game again. <laughs> it's fun. Dude, I, I was very impressed. Someone kicked the crap out of me last night. So I hate playing someone with a disrupt deck. Do you know what I mean when I say that? Yeah. Um. So the but this guy had one like I've never seen before. It wasn't like throwing cards at me or putting playing my cards or even putting negative cards on my side. It was just knocking me around with like Juggernaut and Stegron and Arrow and all these other cards. It was, but it just fucked up every move I tried to make because I'd play a card somewhere and he'd knock me over into another arena and it was very effective. And I got my ass kicked and I was irritated, but it was less irritating than playing someone who plays a real disrupt deck, which I just exit right away. Why, why, do, it's my downtime to play. I don't want to play with you. You fuck up every move. You, you mean to tell away. me you don't have fun getting Professor X? That's not oh. fun for you. Ugh, that <laughs> card, that stupid fucking card. <laughs> honestly, I do. I just exit right away. Like, I'm sorry. I honestly, I don't know who plays with people who are playing those disrupt decks. Like, why does anyone want to waste their time with that? It's infuriating. I guess if you've got, I'll play someone who's trying to play that deck on me. If I'm playing a destroy deck and I know I can go in and chop up all that stuff they're trying to do to me. So sometimes if I think I can shove it back in their face, I'll stay in, but Mostly it's, it's too, my life, my time is too precious, man. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin, Gavin said, uh, he said, I would play while drawing like an insane person. <laughs> that is unbelievable. That, um, that, that is to say, DC editors, he stopped doing that. So you can, <laughs> get, you know, give him more work. That's fine. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, Gavin we... also Go. Gavin also gets to draw uh, the last issue of the arc, which is very exciting. Except for I haven't quite figured it out yet. It'll be okay, Gavin. Don't worry. <laughs> so it will be exciting. The excitement is coming. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> he did this really great design on redesign on Zealot. So she's helping Meridian in the non portal stuff, and uh, so he did. But we want we're like she's not going to walk around 
Gotham in the middle of the day in that outfit we had her in Themyscira so like what's like a more street level so he did this great with like a sporty like sport jacket it's like a red with a yellow stripe it's very cool very excited I think it's fun was... it's so fun working with cool people who just know how to do cool shit man I think Gavin was watching the stream while he was redesigning sell it <laughs> <laughs> He might have been. Don't get. We're gonna get him in trouble with with DC oh, right. at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I, for, I forgot about Gavin's promise. <laughs> Before we uh, stray too far away from the Birds of Prey, there were a couple of listeners that had questions specifically about that um, that we actually haven't touched on quite yet. So sure. uh, I'll get the first one, and then uh, Tyler, you get the next one. So Dan Trudeau said. What was her decision-making process for what characters to include in Bird of Prey? And did she find any of them more challenging to write? So I sort of just reached for, you know, I, Birds of Prey felt to me like the perfect thing for me to do at DC. But there's no guarantee of success on these things. And if you fuck up Birds of Prey, maybe you don't get to do any more DC projects. So I honestly went into it going, I want to make the coolest arc I can in case I only get one shot at it like and I'm going to reach for every all my favorite characters and so that's what I did Cassandra Kane is like my favorite DC character she was in I was definitely I knew I had to have at least Dinah or Barbara and I like them both but I prefer Dinah if pressed and she worked a lot for the stuff I wanted to do. And when I came up with this idea of bringing sin back in and doing this whole like emotional thing, I, for two reasons, I left Barbara out of it mostly because I wanted to see, I wanted to create some new and different dynamics and set up a more like, not necessarily tension, but maybe some tension for some future stuff with Dinah and Barbara. Um, I also just wanted to do something new. Like I, I wanted to bring people something they loved, but with a new flavor. And I thought, I don't want to just rehash Dinah and Barbara beats. So like, let's build it a little differently. Let's get there in a different way. Um, I Barda is another of my favorite characters. I did not know when I brought her in that she and Cass would just ping off of each other like they did. Yeah. And that's why you do it. That's why you do this this way because it's when it works, it's really magical. I mean, yes, you can fall on your face sometimes because you're like, oh, that didn't quite gel how I thought it would. But man, when it works, it feels so good. Um, and then I wanted to do Zealot because for a lot of reasons, I think she's, I think they're doing a great job of like bringing those Wildstorm characters in and like building them into the DC universe. But I think they need help. I think the more places you can put cool, interesting characters like that, that have an interesting side to explore uh, is the best. So I thought that was great. I brought Harley in because I thought we needed, I thought we needed funny. I didn't know Barda and Cass were going to, be as funny as they were together as cute as they were and even so they're still pretty quiet like cast especially so you're not getting you're not getting the levity you maybe want and need in a book and when you're dealing with really serious stuff i mean the arc is called mega death i mean that's sort of a joke but it's also literally megara and a death like it's 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 serious stuff and when you're going to do that you have to balance it so she was some of our levity for sure as we were getting into it and I just, yeah, I just reached for everyone I wanted and nobody said no. And so I just kept going. And uh, I'm so glad. Yeah, and kind of following up on that, uh, the other question we have from a Tom account is, Loving Birds of Prey, Kelly, how daunting is it to jump into a team book where characters' histories range from a few years to 80? How do you research that many characters with that much backstory? It's pretty hard. It's pretty hard. It's honestly, it's one of the biggest problems with my black label pitch that I mentioned before. It's just because I don't feel, I have trouble pitching when I don't feel confident about my knowledge base. And so um, Birds of Prey, I felt very solid on, I felt very solid on Barda and on Cass. Although I haven't read all of the Cass stuff that's like the last decade stuff. Like I've only dipped in here and there which is a little scary because it's some more recent stuff, but I just feel like I know who that character is in a really core way. So I can then try to 
pick up stuff I've maybe missed that that you worry is maybe out of sync with other stuff to to keep it a little you know you I don't want to write her out of character but I feel like my version is the correct version <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like that about Barda too um I so you know it's a fine line it's a fine line where's how much research is too much research so that you feel like you're not even bringing yourself to the character there's a tricky thing. I always wish I had more research, but I do find that if you do too much, you're just doing that. And it's getting in your way of trying to like break new ground and do some interesting things. Um, I try to make sure I've at least got the basis basics though. And then you try and lean on your editor a little bit to be like, listen, you know, I'm still like a great example is I did that Harley Quinn short before birds of prey came out in the one of those black white and redder anthologies mm -hmm. and i'd never written harley before and so i just said to the editor i'm like listen i the voice is close i think but like i you know is, does she say yeah does she say this and, you know like getting that right i was like i'm paying attention to it and i'm trying to do it right but it's gonna need some massaging and she looked at it and she's like yeah she goes in general i'd say this and this like she gave me a couple guidelines i was like that is perfect and when i did the repass on the dialogue it just clicked you know so it's all a finessing of to, to figure out where you're at i i like to have the research but it can it can overwhelm you and like sort of um trip you up like suddenly everything is what came before instead of what you're trying to build do you know what I mean totally and I think there are times when I have felt like this feels this particular rendition of this character feels too much like it's trying to emulate something that this person thinks the character is supposed to be mm -hmm. versus the character and then their version of it yeah in a way that meaningfully adds without detracting from what came before it's 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 a crazy like tightrope that you kind of have to walk i have a lot of respect for all creators who do this because that's wild it is a weird tightrope because i do think the magic is knowing the character knowing the existing character well enough that it doesn't feel out of character to most readers but adding something that not everybody could add like I do think that's what makes something special I don't think you have to do that just to be able to write you know Cassandra Cain's appearing in your book okay do your best with her to get the voice right to respect what the character's about and what can she can do and can't do or whatever but there's someone who can do that and can also bring something even if it's something small that's specific to them as a writer that's I think when you tend to really feel like somebody has particularly nailed a character or done something particularly interesting with them is when they're able to bring something a little different than what you saw before I do think that's a little bit what's happening with Barda on Birds of Prey because I've gotten a mm. lot of people going most occasionally you get people going what's wrong with her like she sounds funny or you know why isn't she speaking right I heard one guy go is she retarded so yeah that's fun what? I, I don't, you know, people are, people are the way they are. Um, I, my take on Barda is that she's so powerful. She doesn't assimilate. Barda doesn't assimilate. Barda is Barda. Like she is, things break against Barda. Barda does not break against things. And so she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't, um, you know, but, but it's not to say one of my favorite Barda stories, I don't know if you guys have ever read it, is one where she gets obsessed with this suburban, you know, because she wants, she doesn't want to be in Apocalypse all the time. She's raised in hell. Let's yeah. live in America. Seems <laughs> pretty good to live in California. So she's into it. Whereas Mr. Miracle is more torn up by that. He's a more heroic character. She's more things break up against me. I am what I am kind of a thing. I'm not saying she's not a hero. She does a lot of beautiful, powerful things. I love her, but he's much more cursed with that. What is that? And, and, and what can we do about it? And how can we fix the world? Um, there's a great issue where the J the justice league are helping, or maybe it's the justice society. No, it's justice league are helping them rebuild their house and like green lantern used energy nails for the whole thing so it all falls apart when he leaves because they all 
it's, it's a fucking great it's a great little story oh. if you haven't read it <laughs> so there's all this there's all this fun weirdness with barda but i do write her differently than she's been written before and i knew not not from everybody i think the roots of what i'm doing are all the way back in the kirby stuff i think it's all found there but i do think it's a slightly different take on it and i was worried about it because i know it's a little it's a little something i'm adding that i think is special but it's a risk because when you do it you're like you don't know if this is going to connect with people or not i had our first good sign when ben reading the first script he goes I love how you write Barda and I was like oh I was like thanks and he goes I wasn't really convinced she was gonna work here and I was like oh I'm glad you kept your mouth shut (laughs) 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 Like, and so you know that was my first sign like okay you've convinced the editor who wasn't sure and so that's a good sign and then you know obviously it's gone over pretty well uh overall um I just love her. I think I think she should be in everything. <laughs> I agree and 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 just can I just say thank you so much for you know putting her in that uh that outfit at the end well, of Birds of Prey number 7. If you think that's fun, you're going to want to get a couple issues of 8. I because... I'm going to need a couple and and I have a feeling that the fight you described, the action you described is going to take place with these women in these outfits that we see the men at the end of 7 and I am ready for that. Well, not yes, really ready. Except but... for except for what happens if Barda thinks the clothes have mind control. Oh, okay. I can put the pieces <laughs> together there. <laughs> All right. Well, it's so fun. It's so fun. <laughs> and Javi did an amazing job. I tried so hard to get DC to let me do um, a little teaser on my sub stack, but they were like, well, what are you going to write? I was like, I'm going to put this image on my sub stack. Okay. And they were like, okay, but what will the post be about? I was like, never mind. It's a perfect <laughs> example, perfect example of better to ask forgiveness than permission. I, yeah. that backfired huge on me. Well, um, you know, it's funny because uh, we actually, I showed the audience uh, when we reviewed birds of prey, number seven, I showed the audience that last page is like, look at what's coming. And we got flagged for that. So to speak, (laughs) we got flagged. So, you know, well, you'll be in big trouble on the next issue. (laughs) Um, We want to be able to show it. (laughs) Yeah, no, you definitely won't be able to show some of it. Um, It's, I find it, I find it hilariously fun. I just just love comics, man. I think they're great. They're so flexible and bendy and weird and cool and stupid. I just, um, we're having a lot of fun um these spreads i you know i knew we were pretty tight on deadline with javi and so i designed these action spreads for this issue eight because i thought it would be fun and cool but also so that it could all take place in the same location so he didn't have to like reconceive the idea for every double page spread he could just like change the figures and the chaos inside it and man it worked so much better than i thought it's so fun it's uh it's terrific and there's a there's basically like a spread where barda is definitely the star and there's a spread there's a single page where vixen is just i mean gosh javi's work on it is so beautiful and then there's a spread where vixen crazy power set and then a, a a canary one and i mean they're just gorgeous i think they're digital unfortunately because i bet javi would be able to sell them for a fortune especially that barda one. <laughs> oh my god oh my god when does this issue drop i th- I need it now i think it'll be the beginning of april so it'll probably only be a couple weeks yeah oh so everyone make sure fun. to make sure to up your patreon donation <laughs> so that when we you know hit that demonetization we can uh we can make up for it <laughs> oh my goodness look we we uh we are running short on time i, I want to make sure we respect kelly's time i really want to briefly talk about the call yeah of course so the call is of course it's by kelly but then also you are joined by uh matia de Lu- I- I Luis. Yes, or okay. close enough. <laughs> yeah, sorry if I if I didn't get no, that. No, no, it's about right. as well as I can do it too. I'm terrible. I'm terrible. And then with... uh, letters by Hassan Atman Ohal, just a superstar. Um, he really is. This book knocked me on my ass. Oh, thank it, you so it, much. It knocked me on my ass. It has a blend of of various different things that I really love, 
that it's almost like I feel like sometimes you read something that someone does, you know, a creative team, and it's like, whoa, it's like this is this was made for me. Like what like get out of my brain type thing. <laughs> um, just because of the cross section, it's like it's got some buffy to it that's easily recognizable. It's got some like even um what's that one movie with uh Michael B. Jordan where they get the powers and then Chronicle. he sort of turns chronicle. It's got it got a oh, tiny wow. bit of that in it. It's got all these different things that I'm like, oh, I love all of this. And the character dynamics, I fell in love with Lux throughout the whole book. Um, the brief idea is that these these kids, they go into this like almost limb. I think it's literally called the liminal space. And, you know, it's this world where things are not exactly what they expect. And they're doing this to rescue a friend. And the things that they see there and the way that the world is different when they leave leads to some pretty incredible uh, moments in storytelling. The final issue, which I actually I actually have right here, the final issue, issue five, is incredible because, <laughs> you know, things are, you think everything is great and, you know, the heroes are the heroes. And then you get to the end and I will not spoil it. I can't do it. I think <laughs> everyone needs to go buy this. But I literally said, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck did I just read? And then I was like, oh my God. And then my mind went and did the thing. I, I went backwards and I said, yes, okay, this was there. This was all set up. It's a beautiful twist that it's just like not every book does this. And I love when I get surprised like that. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for reading it and for getting it for, you know, sort of when Maddie and I knew based on his speed and everything and when he would need to go back and sort of honor some other commitments we knew we were going to have to wrap up in five and I was like I don't know how we're gonna do it like we really wanted to do this idea we were super excited about it and I was like I don't know how we can realistically do what we're talking about in five and then I was like well if we go in and out of the liminal space quickly and we deal with we let we let ourselves have a chapter that is an action packed emotionally like bomb of an emotion i think we can still have this ending and make it work and i hope we'll get to do more and but if we don't it can still still be this story and stand on its own but we knew it was a risk so it's really happy when someone responds to it like you do because that's exactly what we're hoping for is that it's a what the fuck and but it was still an incredible experience and like it feels like you'd be happy to get more but if that's all it is like that's a crazy story that you got to read right like that's the best you can hope for sometimes so that's what we were going for guys sorry my cats are I, to go to war <laughs> we deal with that in tyler's background all the time <laughs> yeah, yeah this is i uh time, so. i really hope there is more because i just i need to see what happens yeah. next yeah um i'm gonna give this the hard sell you know last time i we we had you on and we talked about how amazing black cloak was and i know that some of our listeners weren't initiated yet just like i wasn't but i read <laughs> it and it was great and everybody else read it and the people that read it in our discord they loved it yeah. i'm making the same proclamation about the call thank you you have to buy this book it's difficult to get books like this out on the market because there's no superhero on the cover right there's yeah. no like yeah. you know it's not it's not birds of prey yeah but this is the way that our favorite creators really take it to the next level and eat and support themselves and tell the true stories that are inside their hearts. I can tell this is a story that you needed to tell. So yeah. because of that, because of how amazing the art is and frankly, how it is, it manages to become unique despite the fact that it wears its inspirations on its sleeve. This is something that I think everybody needs to try. It's only five issues. That's not too much to ask. Give it a chance. It's great. Thank you so much. It means a lot. I uh, it was a real labor of love. Uh, Maddie and I um, we're currently working on some other stuff together, but the hope is we're going to do more. Cull. We have a lot of ideas about where it can go. I mean, part of the appeal, of course, of this concept is that 
you can do almost anything with it. I mean, uh, with what those kids know and with what's on the table for them, you know, they, they're, they can't have what they want, but they can have like almost limitless, fascinating adventure. Um, we talk about, when we talk about influences for it, we talked about sort of grown up Goonies. We talked about mm. Annihilation. We talked about, mm-hmm. I talked a little bit about the expanse. I think because it's on earth, it feels more Annihilation than the expanse, but in the, in the proto molecule idea and like some of the ideas in the expanse which is like a space alien sort of like technology whatever um and then but there's also like sliders in there you know of like kids kids you know finding other worlds like it's a it's a truly cool adventure and i think because of the way we built the kids and we built that concept it can really go anywhere and do anything and we'd really like to do that but comics are expensive and hard to make and you know that's a tough market right now it's a very i think you know the problem with comics right now is a very very weird problem where it's just an embarrassment of riches there are so many good books and there's not the market is just not that big it can't stretch to to for everyone to buy all those books and but what are you going to do say these books shouldn't be out they're great like what who who goes who doesn't get to come it's a it's a tough situation it gets a a beautiful thing uh, but you know even a beautiful thing can kind of take you down i guess you know um so i hope we're going to do more there's talks there's plans we'll see um you know, if it, it, one thing that really hurt us was, I feel like this was certainly my most optionable material, but because it came out both after a pandemic that has changed things and then during a writer's strike that wrecked things and reset things, it's, it made it really difficult. But like, you know, if we can get option, if we get optioned, if we get picked up, like the trade will come out. If we can pick up some trade readers, you know, I think word of mouth on it is really good. That's been true of Black Cloak too. That's part of how we're able to do more Black Cloak. Um, so we've got more Black Cloak coming in June. Um, and yeah, I'll be I'll be putting some really fun stuff on. Meredith has been doing these incredible, you know, because it's a there's a five year jump between the gap. And so Meredith has been doing age up, aged up designs for everyone. And also it was a horrible, you know, it ended in a horrible blaze that was wrecking the city. So some things have happened to some characters. Um, and so we're going to be doing some great drops on the sub stack uh, with the new art. We're also going to do another character creator where one winner will get to create their own character for the book and things like that. So it'd be fun. Can you go ahead and plug the Substack for everybody? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, 1979semifinalists.substack.com. And it's a awesome. great place. If you want to stay in touch with me, that's really the best place because, first of all, that links to everything so you can always find everything. And more than anywhere else, it's where I am when I'm talking about my stuff and showing previews and everything. And we, like I said before, we've built like a nice little community there. And we sometimes playing games and things. And I'm also doing, it's not come out yet, but I hope it's going to be coming out by the summer. I'm doing a prose thing that's called Margo and Layla Must Die. And it's very experimental because it's going to be a thing where we post a chapter and then and then readers vote on where we go next. What? So it's sort of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, it's experimental. Let's put that out there. <laughs> I've never done it before. It's taken way more prep time than I thought to like figure it all out, how it's going to work. But yeah, the idea is that I'm sort of writing on the fly in concert with the reader it's um huh. it's a pretty cool idea yeah do you like, go ahead Kill. how huh do you how how <laughs> i'm trying to figure out how to word this how um uh, how is your prose muscle i guess is what i'm asking like right. you know is this going to be like a weekly thing or a monthly oh, thing well i would say it's pretty atrophied which has been part of the problem okay. um yeah. 
there's you know one of the things nobody talks about in comics is that if you're someone who also writes prose and you go write comics for a while one of the greatest things about comics that everyone always talks about is the collaboration it's yeah. that you write part of a thing and then someone births it into another thing and when you're writing prose there's no one to do the second part you have to do it all and it sucks it's so <laughs> hard I, i've forgotten how hard it is so but another reason i've slowed down i had wanted this to come out like at the beginning of the year really in an ideal world which i do not live in much to my chagrin um i i just i think the idea is really really good like i would write a real novel with this and so i started being worried about well i don't want to be too casual with it like i want to make sure i give this the time to really build it into what i think it can be when i just started i was like oh yeah it's a fun little thing but now i'm like oh wait there's really great layers to this idea this could be something so but i don't want to not make it what i pitched it as i think it's really exciting to be this idea of writing it on the fly i think probably the idea works best if i can do every other week so two chapters a month because then that way it gives people time to read it and vote and then for me to do another one um but the chapters will have to be short they'll be short and that will be both to fit my schedule so that I can maintain it, but also because I don't want, I want people to read it as just quick chapters and then vote. Like if it becomes something where people are sitting on it for a long time because, oh, I don't have time to read this right now. Like, do you know what I mean? Like I found as I'm working on it, it has to be like intense the chapters it has to be like we have to read it now like if i want to get the kind of engagement i want they've got to be great and short and sharp so it's been tricky to to calibrate that it's going to be an experiment i'm sure some of it won't work but i'm pretty excited about it we back when i thought we were going to be able to launch at the beginning of the year we had done some things in the fall where like i let them pick the character's last name like i presented it to them so they've already made a few choices and there will be, I think, two more before we start on chapters. But I've just been so busy with comic stuff that I've had to, like, put it to the side a little bit. It's pretty exciting, though. If it can work, it could be amazing. But, you know, I'm used to things not working. So maybe it'll be that. <laughs> that sounds super fun. And I'm going to have to subscribe to the Substack to uh, partake. Comic Boom in our chat says, I subscribe to Kelly Thompson's Substack. Well worth it. So there you go. Oh. That's nice. What an endorsement. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think for people before the Substack was super valuable because you were getting Black Cloak and the call. And I mean, not to, not to um, make everyone run over there and be able to read all that work for five bucks. But yes, in theory, you could subscribe for one month, read all of Black Cloak and all of the call digitally, and then unsubscribe and it would have cost you $5. So you can do that if you want, but we hope that you instead stick around and read all the other stuff that's going on there. This prose stuff is a new thing we're doing we'll have new black cloak starting up in june but admittedly it's been a quiet time for the sub stack just because i've been working on a lot of development stuff so but uh but we still try to keep it fun with like news and games and stuff uh i was thinking maybe this last month of march i'd try to do a little x-men game that we do we play x-men war with the old x-men cards and again you have to have a paid subscription in order to vote but it's been pretty fun that's awesome yeah, I even made new cards for a few of them because we just were getting a little bored with the cards, the existing cards. And like, so I took cards that had maybe changed over the years, like the Psylocke card I made into a Captain Britain card and things like that. So it's fun. I mean, I'm a nerd. This is what we do. <laughs> <laughs> can can we get, go ahead. No, 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 you go. Uh, I was just going to say, can we get to a couple of more uh, listener? Co we have like so yeah. it's crazy the amount of <laughs> sure. comments we have right now. Sure. Um, so if we could just run through a few more. Uh, Kale, you ready with one? Uh, I definitely can be. You want me to just hit the next one? Yeah. Uh, it's by Spiral Storm, by the way. I think the name is missing there, but yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Then Spiral Storm says Captain Marvel and Black Widow are two of my top five Marvel characters. What was your approach and mindset toward those characters? Um, so I think I I see Black Widow. Some people write her more chatty. I write her pretty quiet. I think she's a 
um i mean I, not that she doesn't have an internal i think she's always got an internal narration going because she's always thinking she's always making moves she's that kind of a character but she plays that all very close so i don't write her with a lot of um jokes i mean there's there's jokes but it's not a you know it's not a harley quinn cracking cracking things all the time I also really wanted to write her mostly away from the Red Room, not because I'm not interested in it, but just because it felt like really well covered. So it was fun for me to sort of take on that kind of character with that kind of history and let her try to carve a new path. That was sort of what we were trying to do in Black Widow, that she'd had this really powerful experience and she didn't want to just walk away from it even though she had to and so she tried to build something a little different that felt like like what she needed emotionally right then and um i don't know i really enjoyed writing that book it was probably my favorite book i did at marvel captain marvel is a very different problem i i really like carol i have fun writing her but there's so much baggage that comes with it because of how people feel about her i guess driven initially by the civil war stuff that the people didn't like especially in civil war two i guess and yeah. then and then some weird hybrid of the movie or something i don't know but like when people are mad about a character cutting your hair like you just have to go all this it feels so frustrating because you know while that didn't happen on my watch i was well aware of that happening to to margie and and kelly sue and how frustrating it was like you're doing all this really hard interior work to make these great character stories and all people can do is bitch about this artist drew her looking too masculine or we don't like this haircut it was so frustrating and it was nice to not have that kind of baggage with natasha um and like i said with the birds of prey and dinah it's been really funny to see the contrast but so with carol i felt like there was a lot of rehab i had to do not from what other art writers had done or artists had done they'd done good work but against this perception of what she is this perception that she's unfun or a hard ass or a unfeeling or a man-hating feminist cliche or something there was all this stuff in there that felt like people were stapling onto the character that just wasn't true or real and so I felt like it was my job to really make that voice for her really relatable and approachable and fun without trying too hard I mean like to me Carol's got sort of like a dad jokes kind of an energy like she's funny but sort of in like an eye-rolling way whereas Spider-Woman Jessica Drew is like genuinely funny um so, you know, you just kind of approach those kind of things. But like, you know, it was important to me to surround Carol with people that she was invested in and trying to care for and trying to protect to like help show all these ways in which she's great. And then to just really lean into like power stuff with her because her power stuff is so cool. I struggle with that stuff a little bit because sometimes I don't think big enough, but I did really push on Carol to try to think big like her power set is, which helped. Yeah, that's awesome. And both of those runs are great. And I think people should look that stuff up too. I mean, you talk about a creator who really has um, just knocked it out of the park. Like every time it's, it's, it's crazy. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm st I like, what's it going to be like in five years? It's unbelievable. Oh, let's not say I'm going to get any better. We may have peaked. Oh, <laughs> uh, Tyler, can you get the next one? Yeah, so this is from uh, Christian Uncaged. Uh, what are your thoughts on your four-year Captain Marvel run, uh, and specifically issue 50, now that you have some distance from it? 50 was good. I'm happy with 50. I really struggled with it initially because I kept trying to make a big fight thing in it. And why? Why? doesn't need a big fight thing. Like, we've done that. I've been doing 49 issues that have about five pages plus of fighting in every issue like that's not what we needed to be about it was about emotional stuff it was about closure it was about uh, what she's going to be in the future you know and once i realized that i needed to not make it about a big fight um it really helped um it really helped that david and javi did that art it was just beautiful and really i really trust them and i knew they could like land the sort of emotional components without pushing it 
over into like a saccharine territory i also knew they could handle all those guest characters pretty well which was crazy um i loved doing captain marvel it was hard it was never my favorite book um probably because of all the attention on it in weird ways although i will say that the fan base the captain marvel fan base is incredible truly one of the most kind and non-judgmental non-knee-jerk reaction fandoms i've ever seen i mean like I guess they feel like I took pretty good care of Carol. So maybe they don't have a lot of complaints, but like, but when I see Spider-Man and birds of prey and X-Men fandoms and stuff coming out, I mean, I'm just like, wow, that Captain Marvel fandom, I was pretty lucky. <laughs> they were great. <laughs> and they were, and they really helped the book too. I think they were very like good at promotion and stuff and like really getting people excited. But I think my favorite thing about that book is that, toward the end they both let me have my x-men brood arc which i was trying to do from the beginning and the arc before that is super weird and i feel like nobody at marvel comics would have ever let me do that if i wasn't in the middle of a successful 50 issue run of a character that struggles for them but they let me do it with this it was the one where binary is having like identity confusion and carol is trapped in that magical prison in the white room and so she's like you know living in like some kind of star wars you know weirdness and we use these cool art and it's just a weird arc that i feel like this is gonna sound like i'm saying i'm like someone great like grant morrison or alan moore but i did feel like a run they were like oh just a weird sci-fi story stacked in the middle of this and i was really proud of it for it being weird and for marvel letting it be weird and letting it be part of this emotional journey the character was going on it was probably my favorite part of that was that last year we really got to push on things and have cut loose a little bit and it was nice that's awesome I, I really wanted to get on this question here from Zero Zaku, who says, uh, Kelly, where are some good places to read comic book scripts? And what are some books that are good for people who want to write comics? So basically looking for some, you know, advice on how to get into this thing you do. So it can be weirdly hard to find scripts. I think actually your best bet is to find a couple writers you like and follow them on newsletters and things. I know I've put up a Black Widow script before. I, mm. Brian, um, Brian K. Vaughn has put up scripts. I think Scott Snyder has put up scripts. Um, I don't know if Three Worlds, Three Moons has, but I would bet they do because they have a ton of process stuff. So if you look at sort of writer newsletters or websites or whatever i bet comic writers if you follow some of those i bet you will either find some or find some connections to where you can find some you can also just search like online i mean they they do sometimes have them just people you can find them that way um you can also find if what you're looking for is a template more than a script like because you want to know how to write one as opposed to reading scripts dark horse used to have one online that is the basis for what i use i've modified it over the years but it's the, the it's the format i started with or the template i started with um but um what was the there was a second part of that question it oh, was uh, oh yeah go ahead. no what was it i'm sorry yeah no that's okay so it was uh what are some good books for people? Oh, books, yeah. right, right. So the best book, in my opinion, of any book about comics is Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. It's brilliant. It's simple. Mm -hmm. It's smart. It will teach you so much. Um, I haven't really read. Um, I I read that Alan Moore one. I think I've read part of Stephen King's on writing. I've read script books before, but I'll, to be honest with you, my biggest recommendation if you're trying to learn how to write comics would be read understanding comics do what you're talking about by finding a couple scripts so you can get familiar with the format and like how it works and then just read comics and honestly if you feel like reading comics is a cheat assign yourself homework after every comic you read you have to write a 500 word review about that comic to explain how it's good and how it's bad and why mm. why it's good and bad what what would have made it work what would have made it better um why it shouldn't have ever been a comic in the first place whatever it'll teach you so much 
Um, I enjoyed very much my time at SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design, where I got a sequential art degree. It taught me a lot. I had a great experience like anyone with college does, but um, you could learn most of what I learned by um, by reading, understanding comics and reading a lot of comics. Uh, the best education for me really on the boots was writing reviews for CBR because it just made me, it made my analysis skills very sharp. And, uh, you can do that too. It's all self-taught. So. Unfortunately, you probably can't write for CBR anymore, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that'll be just AI or whatever. It's yeah, uh, so that's, sad. That's the sad, dark future for all of us. Um, yes, indeed it is. Uh, Marco, can you hit one more and then we'll do one more after and we'll let Kelly go. Yeah. Uh, from Catherine, this is Since Black Cloak came out and I love that. I've been keeping an eye on what you do. Uh, I also picked up and enjoyed Black Widow. The last thing the pals had Kelly on the show stood out to me and, and is now one of my favorite interviews. Uh, you are awesome, Kelly. Oh, that's so nice. Uh, honestly, it makes me so excited that someone would read Black Cloak and then go search out other work or the reverse, you know, like usually for creators, it happens the other way. Like they pick up your mm. creator owned after finding you on something else. But I just, I, it's funny. This is, it's funny. We're talking about this because it took me a really long time to learn to follow creators a really long time, like way too long mm. as a creator. I, I should have been fucking smarter. Like it's ridiculous. <laughs> so I'm not, I don't judge people for taking their time to figure it out too, but it can be pretty sad. I saw a pop verse quiz the other day that was like, what, what makes you follow a book or whatever. And I knew characters would win. I knew, but it was 70% oh. and creators only got 9%. It, it creators got beat by format which i don't even really understand because format. most books other than things that are web only you can get in pretty much any format you want so uh, it's a weird question but creators losing huh. to format and losing that 70 percent creator characters was a bummer i knew i know it's true i know it's how we all process this stuff and what we follow but it was a pretty big bummer so when you hear people who have figured out to follow creators it's honestly it's the greatest it's the greatest thing ever so thank you kelly i like my webtoon scrolling you know I got, that's, <laughs> that's the format right there well, that's fine i got no problem with that i just mean yeah yeah i mean webtoons they don't print most of those right no no not at all maybe like the bat stuff maybe right that I is getting printed yeah 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 but... and like wasn't I guess I don't know what for what, but was Laura Olympus on webtoons? Because that's crazy was, famous yes, and printed. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I feel like there's a, there's a a a disdain for creators that uh, really disappoints me. It's weird, um, isn't it? Yeah, it's and you see it with the AI art conversation oh. now and everything else, and oh. it's just like people really don't give a fuck about creative people. It's, it's sad it really sucks yeah. it's and it sucks because it feels it's it's very um god i don't know what the word is i don't know if dichotomy is like where i'm headed but it feels like people either care so much and it's like this woman who's like who or this person who wrote in who is following your work and supporting your work and writing in and listening to you on a podcast it feels like it's that or it's fuck them fuck them I, they shouldn't get to do that job and you're like what why like what did i do and it's you know uh it, 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 it i don't know how we got so split right and especially from like uh especially from like the the image boom of you know just a couple yeah. of years ago 2012 right like yeah. when yeah. creators were all the rage yeah and you could make a lot of money doing a creator own book that you were passionate about. It was really, it was a viable career. And I'm telling you, as someone who did two books that were pretty well received and sold pretty well and will hopefully be nominated for some awards, maybe like it, it's hard. I did, we did not have a good financial years. Like that's just, I mean, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to complain, but it was brutal. And like, I can admit that I'm new at doing that as a creator owned side, like, you know, so that was sort of my first foray into that, but 
I, it was so much harder than I thought. It was so much harder. And I think because the market has shifted, it was much less lucrative. And I hit at a particularly bad time because of the writer's strike and all of the stuff that had been going on. So mm. just compounded, but like, you know, things, people, things, other creators had told me years ago from like that 2012 boom, exactly like numbers that they were sort of doing and the way they were able to build, like it just, it's not a thing now. I mean, I'm not saying Saga is struggling or whatever. There are still those books that manage, you know, or those creators who are like well leveraged enough, maybe that they they can sort of still make it work. But for someone like me, who's still trying to get a foothold there, oof, brutal, brutal. And, you know, I thought for sure we'd be doing more of the call. I did not think that was going to be a question. I thought if Maddie and I had the time, we'd be doing it. But the numbers just weren't there. It was hard. That's very Sorry. disappointing. Um, yeah. If, if you don't mind me asking a question about that, um, what what was the thing, I guess, that you learned that you weren't aware of um, when you, you know, begun working on Black Cloak and the Call? What was the thing that you learned through that process that maybe will make it a little easier in the future or just that sticks with you? I don't know. I mean, I learned a lot. I learned a ton, but a lot of the stuff that I learned was just practical stuff, like about how to do a book with image and like what the requirements of that are and what the logistics are and like all of that stuff, which I was not familiar with. And like, I feel grateful to now know that, but it also, I had originally planned to have someone doing that for me or at least with me and it not having that also hurt me because it meant I was doing less other writing work to let you know proceeds from the coal go to the places I wanted them to go like funding a new volume and instead they were going to like staying alive because there's a writer's strike and also you're doing all this stuff on your own so you know there was sort of a cascading effect that I feel like you guys are all nodding because I feel like it's very relatable in any field yeah. like that kind of thing can quickly happen and then you're like shit this is all sort of c c colliding together and I'm not going to be able to rescue it and so you know, I think when things like that are happening, like I tend to be like, well, all that matters to me is the quality of the book and that everyone is paid on time. And like, you know, we've honored all our commitments. And so I just want the book to be good. So I tend to focus on that, but then maybe that means you're, 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 you're not leaving a viability for other things. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I learned any clear thing that's, that's, that I'm going to like, oh, I'm going to do that differently next time. I think I just learned a lot of things that are like, oh, this is how it is. And this is what you need to be prepared for. And these are the things you need. But, you know, I don't want to be too grim, especially as we're coming toward the close of this. But like, you know, as someone who's not well leveraged right now and who is like the breadwinner of my whole, like the sole breadwinner of my home right now, um, I don't know how anyone launches a comic without, I mean, because I had an infusion of Substack money and I could not have built those books without that money. And so I look around at other creators who are doing it and I'm like, how are you doing it? How are you doing any of this? Because I could barely do it with a huge chunk of cash to fund it, you know, and I paid all my people well, like, I mean, we didn't go swimming in gold or anything, but like, you know, I paid them working rates because that's what you want when you finally get that money. You're like, oh, let's make a comic and let's have people make a living wage and let's do it the way you're supposed to do it. And so we did everything right. But then like the market's just soft. And so the returns were not what you hope to see. And I just look around and I know for people who don't have a big whack of cash coming in to fund it, like, my God, how's anyone doing this? I mean, I guess it's possible. I'm just incredibly bad at it, but I don't, I don't think that's it. I, like I might, I, I definitely have weaknesses in this area, but I don't think it's that I'm terrible. I think it's that the market is really tough. Well, this is very anecdotal, but uh, I know that I personally heard that this is something that is happening across the board. We've heard of yeah. even big name creators whose names would surprise the audience that are having trouble selling their yeah. non big to work. Yeah. Um. So I, I don't I certainly don't think it's a reflection on you by any means. You know, someone who's more entrenched in doing that, you know, maybe if, for as an as a name example, Scott Snyder, people yeah. have been following him in that vein. Yeah. for a long time but even then you know it's just a, yeah. like you said the market is soft yeah um but well, the, what that go ahead no no yeah i know you're right you're right what that underscores though 
is the importance of finding creators that you like and supporting their work beyond the big two. Because contrary to popular belief, even though, and, and I'm I'm speaking from a place of I'm not a creator. I've just heard this a lot. So if I'm wrong, please correct me. But even if your indie book doesn't sell as much as your Marvel or DC book does, you see more of that money. Yeah, so, that's correct. So when you go and buy the call, you're literally putting money yes. in Kelly Thompson's pocket. You're literally putting money in Maddie's pocket. That's how this industry works. Yeah. So if that means something to you, you can get great comics and support the creator that you really like in a way that you don't quite uh, support them when you get the, you know, the the Marvel or DC work. Take your yeah. pick. So. Yeah, I that that's incredibly true. Everything you said is super true. I always feel a little guilty saying things like that because it feels like it puts so much pressure on readers and fans but there's no way around it that's the only way that's the only way people like me survive is that i've i've made other people care and they're trying to support my work like it's literally the only way i survive so even though I sometimes feel guilty, like, like that it's just because it feels like it's just asking so much. It's like, oh, you not only read this thing and loved it. Well, please tell at least five friends about it and also talk about it on your social media and, you know, get it for a friend for Christmas also. Like, that's a lot to ask of people. So, you know, you feel you feel bad saying, hey, don't just be a fan and like this work and buy it one time. Be a super fan and be an <laughs> advocate and do your own PR tour about my book. Like, it feels like you're asking people to do that sometimes. And it's 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 it's, it's sort of horrible. But they're also the ones that 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 make you know i like I, I answer a lot of fan mail or comments in things or whatever from really nice people saying you know oh my god it's so nice that you responded or whatever and i'm like you're the reason i have a job like that's I, like me doing good work and convincing people like you that i know what i'm doing and that i'm worth your investment is like literally the way i survive so um thank you that's it you know Absolutely. We want to do the giveaway. We want to do this giveaway. We want to get more Kelly Thompson books into the hands of the audience. So if we are ready for that, Tyler, oh, let's yeah. get into that yeah. giveaway. All right. So let me just pick a random name out of here. Let me just copy and paste this list just in case something breaks. It's a wheel spin, by the way. Uh, what's up? It's a, I was just letting them know it's a wheel spin that's yeah, going to, yeah. you know. Oh, so wow. Who's... Okay. So the winner is Joel Anderson. Hey, yeah. awesome. Oh. Congrats, Joel. So, Joel, uh, just reach out to me on Discord and let me know which of the volume ones of any of Kelly's books you would like, um, and we will get that sent out to you. Um, and coincidentally, Joel actually did have a question. This is the very last question we're going to get to for you, <laughs> Kelly. And it was, I'm curious, what are Kelly Thompson's top four comics? Oh, man. So I'm going to pick OGNs, not floppies, just because sure. it's too floppy. I mean, it's impossible. I mean, Uncanny X-Men 269, of course, but also then what, you know? Uh, I mean, honestly, Hawkeye 3. So maybe I could do that list. Anyway, um, <laughs> maybe let's see. Black Black Hole, Charles Burns Black Hole. Oh. Uh, oh. David Mazzucchelli's Asterius Paul. Um next wave agents of hate hmm. maybe or maybe you know what let's do bitch planet volume one instead hell yeah uh and then um mr miracle oh tom, nice. tom king tom king mr miracle i reread it just recently um which was the first time i'd reread it in one sitting as opposed to as it came out and uh man it's just masterful like really is i mean way to trick me into you know this these amazing superhero metaphors but really just a you know a, a meditation on life and fatherhood and death and it's amazing amazing stuff like it's it's the kind of thing you want to give to people who think comics are for kids and honestly most of those people that you would hand that to would not fucking get it and i'd be like okay are they still for kids because did you get it 
Like this is <laughs> literature. It's doing great, powerful, moving, important things. And uh, comics are full of these things. So, well, comics are amazing. Kelly, you're amazing. Thank you <laughs> Thank so you. much for spending time with us. Uh, sorry we went over time. Hopefully you had a good time with us. I did. Um, make sure that you guys go out and grab the call. Go out and grab Black Cloak. Also go out and grab Black Widow, Birds of Prey. Everything Kelly has done thus far has been incredible. Kelly has really hit the ground running with a remarkable career that we're excited to follow. And if you've enjoyed this conversation and you've never read it, any of Kelly's books before, you literally cannot go wrong. So give her a shot. It's worth your time. Thank you to everybody that submitted questions for Kelly. We're going to say goodbye really quick to her off mic, and we will be right back with Kelly Thompson, incredible once again. Uh, really, really enjoy having her on the show. She's such an incredible guest. And for me, what I always get struck by as someone, you know, we've done a lot of these is uh, honesty. Like refreshing honesty is so important to me. Just like as a person beyond this, but also in this, it's like cool to hear someone be willing to talk about not only their big successes of which Kelly has had a lot, but also some of the the things that haven't necessarily gone great. And I think what it does too, is it gives you guys the listener a realistic perspective on what it's like for the people who are creating the work that you love. And I think that's important. They're not robots. Uh, people with aspirations, dreams, uh, and sometimes missteps and that's human. Yep. The, the life of a creative is not easy, but required for everyone else to be happy. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Um, and, you know, sorry if we didn't get to your question or comment. There were so many. Um, and I, as you can see, like we went quite a bit over time. Uh, Kelly was gracious and she's very cool and seems to enjoy speaking with us. But, uh, you know, obviously we, we have our own things we want to get to plus you guys. So it's a lot. And there are a lot of you. It's it's actually crazy how many people uh, submitted submitted comments and questions, not just on Discord, but uh, here in the live chat. And, and the Discord server, by the way, is the best way to get our attention 
as far as like getting your questions a- answered um, from creators. So yeah, for like just to show you how the sausage is made, if you give us your question in advance, then we know where to place it when we're doing the show. So we can, you know, in advance, get that ready. So it's a little easier to give it to us ahead of time. Uncaged said, these interviews floor me, and I get it. Creators like to do some press, but I can hardly believe we have the people from the big books here. You know, um, sometimes, so earlier today, I was reflecting on the fact that I've spoken to pretty much every creator I want to. The only Mm. creator I really want to speak to that I haven't is uh, Jonathan Hickman. But in some form or fashion, I have met and spoken to everybody I like, including like Bendis, Morris, and all those people. So I feel very lucky in that. But when it comes to the show, you know, we've only, it's really only been the last couple of years that we've been able to get the the big fish. Yeah. And a lot of that is due to you guys. When people look and see our numbers, you know, Kelly just talked about, you know, the call and, and Black Cloak. But we have, let's say, let's say a thousand people listen to this, right? Let's let's say that happens. That's potentially a thousand people who could buy her book. And in comics where a hit book could be 40k sales, like a, a Marvel or DC, forget about an indie book where you might be talking about half that for a book that's making people decent money. Um, every viewer, every potential buyer counts. So you know, our support from the, the support that we get from you guys is critical. And then obviously the fact that we sort of know what we're doing on this side of things and people seem to like talking to us. Mm. So that's why we're able to get these creators on the, on, on the horn. But not for nothing, like, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, you know, and that's one of the things I don't think it's wildly out of pocket to say that that's one of the things Jeff Johns has always been impressed with us about, uh, And he said as much, um, I think both on the show and off, um, you know, we've been doing this for so long. They're impressed with our consistency. You know, they can tell that we love it and we love talking about it as much as you guys do. And that we've created this platform, not just for them to get to you, but also we've created it for you, Mm. you know, and that's, that's huge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Tom account says bird, birds of prey first trade out in August. DC is still struggling to get product out the door. I don't understand that. I feel like the first trade should be out. The fact that it's not, and we already are on to the next arc of things is pretty bizarre, but that's DC for you. Um, we've got one more thing we want to do. We always play a game. I really wanted to do it with Kelly, but I just felt like we, we had gone far enough. So, we're going to spin the wheel amongst ourselves and, uh, you know, see what we land on and have a good time. Play a quick game with you guys before we cut out of here. That's right. Can I, I bring Batman? Who I don't remember who which one of you three it was that said we, we wanted to do uh, go to go to Kelly's con. Oh, oh. Yeah, me, me. I wanted to do well, that. I wish we could have done that. Yeah. Next right. time. Next one. Are we ready yeah. for this wheel, Sean? Let's do it. Drum roll. Oh, there's music Ooh. on it, right? we're doing kel's comic-con again is this weighted a certain way (laughs) i want give me the green light so bad yeah (laughs) that's crazy i can't i can't believe that it's landed on that again i mean we could respin it Ah. are you do have one kale i could get one yeah i could get one real easy he has a brain it's uh you know the beauty of it is that it's not hard uh, so if you've never listened before, uh, Kale, uh, Kale's Comic-Con is uh, the, the subject of the game is that I am going to throw a Comic-Con, but it's going to be with a select category of uh, uh, thing. So if I want to throw a Comic-Con uh, relating to all characters who are green, that's what the guys have to figure out. So Sean will say, oh, I want to bring Green Lantern. Cool. Tyler will say, oh, I want to bring uh, 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 Blue from Blue's Clues. What? Tyler, come on. No. I'm not touching yeah. Nickelodeon after this past week. Oh, what a rough one. Um, So, guys, I'm throwing a Comic-Con. Do you want to come? Yes. I do. 
And can I bring Barbara Gordon? I think you should bring Barbara Gordon. Yeah. Man, anytime you say like should or you can, it makes me I'm, I'm like analyzing that. Um, can I bring Big Barda? Uh, yes, I, I think you should bring Bar- okay. Barda. Can I bring Jeff Johns? Nope. Okay. And Can don't bring... don't don't bring anyone he's written either. That's oh. a hint. All right, there you go. Can I bring Storm? No, don't bring Storm. As much as I want her there, you can't bring. He's written Bar- uh, Barbara Gordon before. Uh oh. Three Jokers. <laughs> she screws Uh-oh. Jason Todd in that. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so Storm. Can I bring uh, Aquaman? He, he wrote Aquaman. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> that It was a bigger hint. <laughs> Take it easy. Uh, no, don't bring Aquaman. <laughs> so Storm. Can I bring. Okay. Uh, can I bring. Black Widow. Yeah, definitely bring Black Widow. Is the is the uh, concept characters that were written by women? No. Okay. It probably should have been, but it's not. <laughs> Typical man. Um, can I bring Sabretooth? No, don't bring Sabretooth. Uh, can I bring? Damn, I was gonna say uh, I was gonna ask Wolverine. Is that was or you? are you? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, don't bring Wolverine. Yeah, I figured. Okay. All right. Can I bring Wonder Woman? Yeah, bring Wonder Woman. Yeah, definitely, definitely. If you got it, Sean, go for it. You seem to have. An I aha don't moment. know that I do. Oh, I just, okay. That was I the just... other direction. All right. Can I bring Howard <laughs> the Duck? Uh, hang on. Let me Google something. <laughs> So wait, it's Barbara Gordon. Bro, bro picks a category and doesn't know the answers. Come on. <laughs> I know the answers, but <laughs> you're, you're, uh, yeah. Bring Howard the Duck. He can come. Yeah, he can come. Barbara Gordon, Howard the Duck. And you said Ooh. no to Wonder Woman. No, do bring yes. Wonder Woman. Do, do. Yes, do. Woman. Damn! What the fuck? Um, who's up? Uh, can I bring John Constantine? Mm, not uh, might have an angle. This seems like I'm gonna a vertigo say I'm gonna mind. say yes. Okay, but if he takes if he takes a thing off, he's out the door. Okay, is mm, it's not my turn. What the hell? I uh, I'm stumped. Go ahead, Tyler. Is this characters who have had ongoings that lasted more than fifty issues? Nope. Damn. <laughs> nope. Uncaged <laughs> says, "Can I bring snacks?" <laughs> uh, as long as they're a certain, as long as they're within my category, there is a certain type of Dorito you could bring. Oh. oh. Uh, is the concept <laughs> characters? Sean got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I didn't. Is the concept characters who wear or are defined by the color red? Yep. Okay. Yep, man. I went to Cool Ranch right away, and I'm like, who was blue? Like, <laughs> And the Jeff Johns <laughs> angle was because he wrote Green Lantern, right? Yeah, primarily. Uh, yeah, he, and he's primarily known for green. Yeah. Wait, Constantine? Oh, he's Ty. Ty, yeah. That's why I, I said one. if he takes it off. Oh. Dang. If we have time for one more, I got one. Sure, let's do it. Okay. Uh, I'm running Kale's Comic Con, and <laughs> let me know who you want to bring. Uh, can I bring Swamp Thing? Yes. Oh, all right. Can I bring Batman? No. Can I bring Ragman? No. Can I bring Mr. Miracle? Nope. Can I bring Man Thing? Yes. Mm-hmm. Can I bring is... poison ivy? Yes. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Sean. 
Is the category characters whose powers are tied into the elements? Nope. Mm-hmm. Can I bring the thing? Yes. Mark, can you get that mic closer to you, bud? My bad, my bad. Deep <laughs> throat. Bad Deep casual. Throat. Like, we're not doing a show. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Can I bring... Can I bring Elsa from Frozen? Oh, uh, damn. I'm going to have to Google this now. Hold on. <laughs> oh. oh, interesting. Let Whoops. the Googling begin. Yeah, all right. I'm going to... No. Okay. Love the Frozen movies. I'm a big fan. That's enough. <laughs> right, I'll let it go. Uh, can I bring? Oh, oh, so I'm sorry, Mark. We'll go for it. No, no, no. I uh, go, go. Cause I'm thinking. Okay. Can I bring Superman? No. Can I bring the Wendigo. Yeah. The Wendigo. Wendigo. <laughs> can I bring Storm? No. Hmm. My hint was it would be. It's actually my Comic Con. It's not Kel's Comic Con. Characters Tyler likes. Is it no. characters that are puppets? I don't know. No. Oh, I mean, I mean, no. But okay. So Poison Ivy, Swamp Thing, The Thing, Man Thing. Wait, The Thing was was allowed in. Did, he's allowed. Yeah, okay. yeah, he's allowed in. Yeah. Is it characters who are not primarily human? No. Can I bring Mm -hmm. Harley Quinn? Uh, No. Okay. Okay. Oh. What? Hound's got a good one. Characters? Is it characters that love cats? No. No. Uh, Although I would like to see a comic where Man Thing is petting, you know, a ginger cat or something. But. Yes, <laughs> Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing has a little tabby just walking around the swamp. Can Tiger go? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> is He's it, like, yeah. Is it is it characters who have mm, lost their humanity? No. Okay. Fucking oh, shit, man! I feel like I. Right there. Would you like a clue? Yes. yes. It's a visual thing. So Tigra and Swamp Thing share this in common. Uh, yes. Characters who are humanoid? That would be everybody. Well, that would be everything, Marco. Not crypto. Oh, interesting. Is we it didn't talk about crypto. <laughs> characters who are secondary colors? No, no. I mean, typical artist question there, but no. no. Yeah, Tyler doesn't think that hard. No, I don't. <laughs> Damn. Mm, man, I might have to tap out here. Can I, can I bring Z- Zatanna? No, unfortunately, no. Yeah, there's definitely a theme here. I can, I mean, I'm, ah, I'm on the cusp of it, I feel. Characters with big feet. I mean, does the tiger have big feet? Does I mean you're you're close, Cal? But I think no. Poison Wait. Ivy's got some you know small feet. The characters who are barefoot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cal was. I mean, and, and Sean was definitely like, no, I got something. I got something. I know the angle, bro. I know where I'm going with this. Sorry, I have a print of uh, Mateo Sclera's Poison Ivy in front of me, and there's just a foot staring at me every time we stream. No wonder you have such a fetish. I don't. I swear it's I don't. Subliminal. It's a bit. Dude, it's come a on, bit. bro. Did it, did, come on. Can we just can we just admit this now? Can we get this <laughs> really out of the way now? I really don't. I have a bit fetish is what I have. Let's be real. Uh, <laughs> a bit of toe in your butt. That's all it is. <laughs> we need to expose. That's crazy. Do we need to expose <laughs> the DMs, Tyler? Let them air out. From whomst? All right. Quentin Our Tarantino. own DMs. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> The comics pals DMs. Air it out. Pull yeah. off the socks. My favorite movie is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for particular reasons. <laughs> wow, well, listen, that is my favorite movie too. Probably it's for the same really reason. good movie. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed Kale and Tyler's <laughs> Comic Cons. Uh, Tyler's does not sound like a one I want to go to. Well, well, no, 
I don't because <laughs> when Swamp Thing and Man Thing are walking around, that fucking nastiness they're gonna leave on the ground muck. is not anything that I want to be around. Actual so. muck. Yeah. And I want to I want to be clear, Kingdom of Nerds, we're not king shaming Tyler. They're trying to we get are, something that's not real. We are uh, giving him a hard time that he won't admit it. <laughs> Correct. Exactly. But true. if that's what he's into, that's what he's into. That Norm McDonald joke. Anyone's familiar? By the way, uh, thank you, Kingdom of Nerds, for hanging out with us. Kingdom's got a, a great YouTube channel of his own, so you guys should check that out. Uh, similar vibe to what we do here. Um, Gavin says you love flamethrowers. Yeah, that's why. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, that's why. But I, I'm not trying to call Tyler out or anything like that. I'm just saying that maybe it's possible that okay. Tyler... Okay. Could have an account on a website called Feed, Feed Finder? Finder. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> and and where did I get that from? So I'm just saying. Just saying. I'm just saying. Oh God, I am not looking forward to what my what my phone is picking up right now and what my Instagram <laughs> algorithm is going to be like later. <laughs> oh. Or or are you? <laughs> oh man! So um, Tuesday, this Tuesday is our upcoming book club. We're going to be talking about Hulk, Future, and Perfect. That should be a lot of fun. That's the book that you guys voted for over on Patreon.com slash TheComicsPals. That's the one you chose. So make sure that you come and listen to us discuss it. Um, I am very, very, very much looking forward to talking about this because I have never read an old Hulk story. I've never read a, a mm. Hulk story from before the mid 2000s. So mm. I don't even know what that character was involved in. I only know this book has the maestro in it. And so what excites me so much about those kinds of opportunities is all the research and learning that I get to do and then present to you guys. So if you enjoyed the man of steel book club, which is our easily our best performing book club we've ever done, then you absolutely want to make sure that you come hang out with us for the future and perfect book club we're going to do. Uh, I got a, I did the wrong. I watched the Bradley Cooper movie instead. I was a little confused. <laughs> <laughs> Joel said, yeah, how about some half socks? You know what, Joel? Damn. For some reason, half socks doesn't do it for me the way that half gloves. I do. have half socks. I wear those often, actually. The ankle Pervert. Well, it's so you can show a little ankle when you're wearing some bands, you know? Slut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just that that doesn't have the same oomph to it you know uh so that'll be tuesday at 6 p.m eastern and then also i have the unfortunate displeasure of uh announcing that uh we will not as we announced a couple of weeks ago be joined by jeff johns and jason Fabok this upcoming week unfortunately we could not uh they they had to cancel they had to reschedule so we'll let you guys know when that's going to happen in the future uh, but it will not be this this week, as we had originally discussed. And Tyler is wearing a sh a shirt that says "slut," so uh, the game has changed. Not was, were, much. You, were you always wearing that? No. 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 Oh, okay. Let's have it ready for when Kale calls me a slut on air. <laughs> <laughs> just, just in case, gotta have it. Wow. Okay. Uh, so the next time we'll be live with you is Tuesday, and then after that, it'll be Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern for Pals Pulls. Come hang out with us for that. And then in a message exclusive to our patrons, which you could very well be if you head on over to patreon.com slash thecomicspals, tomorrow is our Patreon hangout. We're going to be chit-chatting about our favorite comics, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, I also have a question. I have a question that I have loaded up for our patrons that I'm hoping to receive some answers to when we hang out. Uh, and that is, and I think it was sort of related to today. Um, what makes you feel connected to the comics and creators that you do? So mm -hmm. for those of you who are on our Patreon page and want to come and answer that question with us, we're going to be hanging out live with our friends on Discord uh, tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. So that should be a lot of fun. Everything else at the Comics Pals, you guys know the routine around here. We will see you in the future. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. Until Tuesday, take care, guys. See you next week.